So welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. It's my very great pleasure to introduce Jude Onwudili from Aston, sorry. Um, I'm really bad when I'm reading things. Um, who's a senior lecturer in chemical engineering and is going to talk to us today about chemical recycling of uh, different model and real wastes in hydrothermal media. Thanks very much for joining us, Jude. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And um, is it okay if I share my screen now? Please do. Thank you. And uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Good. Thank you. All right. So thanks, everyone, for joining us. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking to you about the work we've been doing. Well, not, not just um, recently, but from um, about 10 years ago up to this point, trying to look at um, the recycling of different module compounds and reuse waste uh, plastics in hydrothermal media. So my name is Judah Odili. Um, so I'll give you a brief introduction into why I would think this is important. Um, again, introduce um, the hydrothermal media, what it actually means and what it can do, and look at some of the, um, of the chemistries that we can exploit in hydrothermal media. Uh, some of them are specific uh, to certain plastics, some uh, can be random. And then we will uh, show you some of the experimental research we've done and the results. And just talk briefly about uh, recent news about the large scale application of hydrothermal processing of plastics, and then come to a conclusion and then acknowledgement. Um, some of us actually think that um, in, in a thousand years time, uh, the people who survive us, you know, they would look back to this time and say, uh, we, we lived in the plastic age. Uh, we've got plenty of plastics, different types, thousands, and we produce over 300 million tons of plastic every year. And since the 1950s, when plastics uh, began to take hold, we've produced about 8.5 billion tons. But we use plastics because of their different properties. They are different good properties, such as they are lightweight, they are durable, they are strong. We can mold them into different shapes. And therefore, they have very wild, uh, wide uses and applications. Uh, there's this uh, mantra, plastic makes it possible for food packaging to protect our food, to some being strong enough to stop bullets protecting us, uh, some providing cushion. And they make vehicles with a road transport vehicles or airplanes, plastics make them lighter, which lower fuel consumption. Uh, they can protect us from the rain, uh, raincoats and all of that. And we use quite a lot of plastics in electrical and electronic goods and so many other household items. Um, so the, this lecture or webinar is coming uh, uh, during the uh, world, uh, the time the world is looking at the uh, challenges of plastics. And this uh, image here just shows uh, a news article about the World Environment Day. Uh, which says that plastics are, you know, they are a wonder to use, but when it comes to uh, getting rid of them, they become a nightmare. And below you see the image. This is the amount of plastics we have gathered in my own family, my household in the last one week. So uh, everybody, you know, uses uh, plastics. But of course we've got challenges. These challenges are why we are talking about plastics. They are everywhere. Every year we generate over 240 million tons of them. And they make up 12% of the municipal solid waste. They are unsightly. They can cause fire, you know, and release very toxic uh, gases. They cause marine pollution. We've seen images on television, on news uh, 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 articles where you have fish, uh, fishes and marine mammals being tangled in plastics. 
Uh, so and and it kills them. Some actually eat plastics, thinking it's food, and they keep eating it, and they get full, but they actually no nutrition, and they die of uh, plastic overfeed. Uh, so we we know that there are issues. They are useful, but it is when it comes to disposal of plastics that we have these big challenges. Uh, so personally, I think recycling plastics is the way forward. And that's why we are having this lecture. So what are the uh, potential sustainable solutions to handling plastics? Well, we could say let's ban the use of plastics altogether. Um, that may be something we think about in the future. But as we speak, there are billions of plastics, you know, in number and in mass all around us. We can think about reducing the use of plastics or reusing them, uh, but recycling uh, of what we already have thrown into the uh, environment looks like the way forward. And that's what we're talking about it. Energy recovery through incineration is not actually recycling in a sense because we, at the end of the day, we, we, we are actually converting these plastics to carbon dioxide and water and some other very harmful gases, even though we get heat energy from it. The advanced methods for recycling include pyrolysis, gasification, whether catalytic or non-catalytic. And then we're going to be talking about hydrothermal processing today. Okay. So advanced thermochemical processing, um, what we do, we take a feedstock and we process them in a thermochemical reactor, whether we're dealing with hydrothermal processing, pyrolysis or gasification, we will always end up with three products, solid product, liquid, and a mixture of gases. Now, the proportions of these products will depend on the type of technology you're using, as well as the uh, process conditions, whether you have a catalyst, whether you're using high temperature or high pressure, they determine the use of products. But essentially, this looks like a very promising solution because as you, we can see uh, here, that it would give very positive impacts, including resource efficiency. We can get back uh, monomers or we can you know, get products that we can use in other ways. Uh, so we can reapply some of the products of this of recycling. So I'm now going to tell you about hydrothermal media. What is this? Uh, basically, it's just water heated to a high temperature and a high pressure. Uh, however, uh, what this means is that we, the, the water, depending on the conditions, uh, is sufficiently uh, heated and held in, in high pressure that it maintains its liquid state until you get to the critical point of water. So you can see the phase diagram of water here. And so normally the processing we do in hydrothermal media will take place around the uh, subcritical, which you see uh, shortly, and the supercritical uh, region. And you can see the different uh, regions here and how the molecules of water interact during in, within this region. And this hydrothermal media has very special properties. Uh, as you can see here from this diagram, there are properties relating to dielectric constant, to the uh, ionic constant of the water, and the density. They keep changing. And these properties are quite tunable uh, under the uh, hydrothermal conditions. So if you look at this table here, published by Brohl and, and his friends, uh, you can see that looking at this table, that depending on the conditions, the water has very dramatic changes in physical properties. As you can see, supercritical water here above the critical point has very, very uh, low density. Dielectric constant is very, very similar to that of uh, normal organic solvents, which means it begins to solubilize organic compounds. 
But what is interesting is that by changing the pressure even at 400 degrees, again, the physical properties of this super of hydrothermal uh, media actually changes. So it becomes tunable. And that means that we can carry out subcritical processes, we can carry out supercritical processes. And the key features we, is that we can enjoy very fast reaction rates. It's almost a fluidizing medium, if you, if you like. So high mass transfer rates is, is possible. We have favorable thermodynamics. It's not very high temperature. Of course, the pressures are high, but not to uh, high temperatures. You have excellent heat transfer and temperature control. And therefore, we can exploit the different chemistries that are possible uh, in this medium. There are a number of different hydrothermal processes, just like, you know, we take something simple and we complicate it in life. That's how uh, we, we grow as humans. That's how we develop as scientists. So we find one method, we try to make it better, and therefore we have many different methods. So there are different uh, uh, classifications that we can go through, whether you're carrying out oxidation to destroy, uh, you know, the organic uh, molecule, maybe the hazardous chemicals you want to destroy, uh, and the different products we get out of those different uh, uh, processes. Uh, today we'll be looking at uh, depolymerization or liquefaction, as the case may be. They sound similar, but they are not exactly the same when you look at it in detail. And then we will also look at the supercritical water gasification, which essentially is to make methane and hydrogen out of organic uh, materials. So what are the different types of chemistries that we can apply for plastic recycling in hydrothermal media? We can classify them, uh, well, this is my own classification based on the initial chemistries that's occurring. It could be hydrolyzable uh, plastics. So we can look at hydrolysis, the, uh, the water can be a catalyst, or we can look at depolymerization. Uh, they may all mean the same or they may all be uh, different. So we are looking at uh, plastics like polyesters, polyamides, thermosets that you cannot actually treat by pyrolysis or gasification, you can look at depolymerizing them under supercritical, uh, under hydrothermal conditions. And you can also have dehalogenation of uh, halogenated plastics like we plastics and PVC uh, with the water being able to absorb, you know, extract the halogens. Uh, uh, during the, the reaction. And you can actually stage this process such that you can have the dehalogenation in the, uh, at the first stage, and then you can do the thermal degradation uh, at, the, uh, at the second stage. Then you can have random chemistries, which you normally have one, you know, above the critical point of water. So all plastics welcome, probably, you know, so, but most plastics will undergo, you know, liquefaction or supercritical water gasification uh, when the conditions are right. Uh, having said that, it is uh, often not very uh, easy to have just one set of reactions occurring. So we normally will have a combination of either the uh, depolymerization and then further uh, uh, thermal decomposition and secondary reactions that will lead to uh, final products. So what sort of uh, plastic feedstock uh, are suitable for these specific hydrothermal uh, chemistries? We uh, mentioned halogenated plastics that are used in waste, uh, well, in electrical and electronic uh, equipment, which when we throw them away at the end of life, they become waste electrical and electronic equipment. Uh, so they will contain PVC, which contains chlor chlorine, and the, uh, then you have brominated uh, ABS and brominated heaps. And you can see here, just for example, uh, the composition of different, of uh, two, two of the very popular electronic equipment we use, personal computers and mobile phones. And you can see here that 
the proportion of these plastics, PVC, uh, ABS, and heaps is, is about 22% of the whole uh, personal computer. And if you look at mobile phone as well, you have ABS and polycarbonate, you know, occupying 29%. Uh, there are other plastics, but we are actually concerned with those ones that are brominated. Uh, and the reason why they are brominated is because we want to make sure they don't catch fire when we're using them. So these brominated compounds are added, you know, as flame retardants. So typically, uh, ABS and HEAPS, high impact polystyrene, make up up to 80% of we plastics. And these are the monomers that we uh, that are used to make them. Um, and then they are, uh, these brominated flame retardants are added. Uh, this is prohibited uh, decabromodifena eater. The EU has actually banned the use of this, but it doesn't mean that this plus they don't exist. Things we bought, bought before 2006 will still be in use in some places or you know discarded in some places. So they will still be around, uh, but we still have uh, the ones that are allowed in the uh, EU are uh, this TBBPA uh, and hexabromocyclodecane. So these are the two, they are still brominated, but they are not as toxic or they don't have any uh, well, human toxicity in the sense that um, uh, DBPE uh, was said to have. And in order to um, make the flame retar uh, retardants more effective, antimony trioxide is often uh, added as a synergist. Um, so another type of feedstock will be with printed, uh, printed circuit boards. So we know what circuit boards are that are usually found in electronics. Uh, they are separated uh, for, before treatment of even the wee plastics. So you can see up to 50 million generated globally annually. Uh, they contain metals, so they can be a good uh, source of mining metals and not just ordinary metals. You can see they have copper, they have gold, even though platinum in very small amounts, but they uh, people actually look at them as source of metals, uh, part of uh, urban mining. There will be ceramics, and then they have about 30% plastics. Again, this ABS heaps and PVC. So the, these plastics um, actually offer us, when they become waste, a, a potential to recover bromine. Um, there's uh, almost all the bromine being made, you know, uh, especially for com from countries like Israel, that is the uh, largest uh, supplier of bromine. They almost entirely go into electronic uh, goods. So if we can, you know, recover them sustainably, then we would need we wouldn't need uh, to make new uh, or explore new uh, resources for bromine. Now you can see the different contents of bromine uh, for the different plastics and the waste pre uh, printed circuit boards. And by a rough calculation. Uh, every year we can actually get uh, up to 300 and uh, above 300,000 tons of bromine out of uh, we plastics in the EU alone. And you can see here the annual production is, uh, is just not uh, uh, much higher than what we have in the waste. And of course the EU directive, uh, which means that this waste, this type of waste need to be segregated and, and, and treated separately, means there's an opportunity here to use uh, a very sustainable, uh, uh, a clean method of uh, treating this type of waste. Now for the random chemistries, like we said, all the other types of plastics are welcome, uh, of course, the polystyrene, different types of polyethylene, uh, polypropylene, and all water, even the PETs, they're all welcome in for the different uh, types of uh, chemistries. 
that are just random, basically is thermal degradation in the presence of water. When it comes to PVC and we plastics, they can still, you know, undergo these degradative chemistries once we have removed the halogens. Okay, and so the 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 experiments were all uh, carried out using battery reactors uh, larger than what you would normally see in the literature. So we're looking at 75 mil, 500 mil uh, uh, capacity reactors. And yes, these plastics don't contain water. They don't contain moisture, they are dry, but of course water participates in the reaction. So that's why we uh, react them in the presence of water. We can use different types of catalysts, homogeneous, heterogeneous catalysts. And then we carry out product analysis, very detailed analysis using instrumental methods like GCs, um, uh, FTIR, and all of that. And we still do some wet chemical methods for some of the uh, products. And this is just um, uh, a diagram to show you know, the sequence uh, of uh, the, if, the, the steps we carry out in the reactions until we get the final products. Uh, but for each of the uh, different feedstock, we will show, you know, the specific steps we carry out. So, for example, here for the model brominated plastics, so heaps and ABS, um, we know that they contain the hydrocarbon backbone. They have the flame retardant, retardant and antimony trioxide, and of course, so we can carry out two-stage process where because haven't found, I'll show you that in the next slide, haven't found that the brominated retardant, flame retardant and the hydrocarbon backbone, they actually decompose at different temperatures. It means we can carry out different, uh, a two stage process where we can, you know, get almost all of the bromine into the aqueous phase, uh, take that off and then we have a, a solid phase that of course contains now mostly the hydrocarbon backbone and the antimony, and then we can process them at a much higher temperature in order to decompose them to gas, uh, oil, solid, and a little bit more aqueous phase. And you can see the different uh, components we get from these different products uh, uh, at this second stage. Uh, yeah, so this is what I, I was trying to allude to there that basically you can see the, the uh, Tmax uh, or that TGA for the brominated flame retardant and the uh, heaps itself are quite different. So we can use that as a way of, you know, separating the, uh, the bromine, removing the bromine or debrominating uh, the, the feedstock before the high temperature processes. So in our experiments, we used about 10 grams of this feedstock, uh, just 15 mils of water because we're using a 75 mil uh, capacity reactor uh, just to uh, keep the pressure on that check because the autogenic pressure raised, uh, you know, during the process can, can go very high. Uh, but, but of course the reactor was designed to be able to go up to 340, 350 bar. And the reaction times were just about 30 minutes. Um, so this is the heaps, uh, and you can see the bromine content 7.6, the antimony content uh, 3.6, and then the rest is mostly uh, uh, carbon hydrogen and just a little bit of nitrogen. And these are the analytical tools we used uh, for, for the gases. So it, this will be a common theme to some of the things we'll be uh, talking about as we go on. Uh, so we use the gas uh, chromatograph with the flame ionization detector for hydrocarbon gases and thermal conductivity detector for permanent gases. And the liquid products, we had to spend a, a little bit more time you know, trying to extract them from water. They normally, of course, will float on top of water because they are hydrocarbons. Then we need to separate them, uh, filter off the solids and carry out analysis with a GC uh, to uh, analyze, to, to, uh, to characterize the, the uh, organic uh, compounds in the oil. 
And then we use uh, the electron capture detector, which is very, very sensitive to bromine to check for the presence of bromine in this, in this oil. And of course, uh, in the oil as well, we used the bomb calorimeter by, de de uh, by burn burning the oil and then um, using some, uh, uh, some bases to, to make sure we capture them as bromide. And then we can uh, analyze the aqueous phase we get from that bomb calorimeter using flame atomic uh, spectroscopy. And we use that for uh, ion chromatography for bromide and uh, uh, flame atomic uh, spectroscopy for antimony. And for the solid, we did the same because we, we thought we found that most of the antimony was in the char. So we carried out uh, um, elemental ana analysis to uh, again check the carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen content of the char. Uh, so this table just shows us the yields uh, uh, of the products uh, and of the different uh, different uh, components of, of the uh, feedstock. Uh, what's important here is just to see with the why do we use alkali, uh, sodium hydroxide, or even potassium hydroxide, and in some cases we had used the uh, you know calcium oxide. Um, it is because without these, you can see the pH of the aqueous phase is highly acidic, and that is not very good for our reactor. We, we found that the first time we did this, uh, the color was uh, greenish because we had, you know, dissolved a lot of iron uh, into, into the uh, aqueous phase because of the highly acidic nature. So but with the use of uh, the sodium hydroxide, you see higher pHs as the case may be, and you can see much higher pHs as the concentration of the sodium hydroxide increased. Almost all the, all the antimony uh, remained in the char, and which means we can just combust it and recover the antimony and we got up to 97.4% bromine in the uh, aqueous phase, which again means we can recover almost all of the bromine. Okay, and these are majority of the compound uh, was the oil product, which we will analyze to see the content. Um, and so, so here, this is just the bromine and antimony recovery, uh, just to show you uh, that, uh, just like you, we saw in the previous slide, that the bromine mostly stayed in the aqueous phase, as you can see here, uh, a little bit in the solid phase, sorry, yeah, in the solid product at the lower temperatures, but a higher temperature that decreased, and we actually did not see uh, bromine you know, any measurable bromine in the oil phase as we increase the temperature. Uh, the same thing happened, happened with uh, increasing the uh, concentration of sodium hydroxide. Uh, so you can see again here without sodium hydroxide, uh, there was plenty of bromine in the aqueous phase, but it was highly acidic. We didn't want to destroy our reactor. And, and so again, as we increase the concentration almost no bromine in the aqueous, in the oil and solid phase. The same, a similar thing happened with antimony, which remained largely in the solid phase. Uh, there was a little bit in the oil phase uh, when we did the acid digestion of the oil, uh, possibly because of some reactions. We do also know that antimony can form um, gaseous oxides. Uh, and they, they may just have, you know, condensed in, in the water during the, when, when we were cooling down the reactor. And in the presence of, uh, by changing the concentration of sodium hydroxide, again, uh, again, you can see antimony 
uh, you know, began to appear in the aqueous phase just because it was beginning to react with uh, sodium hydroxide. So it was forming some antimonate in, in the presence of high concentration of sodium hydroxide. So uh, it was okay, you know, working around uh, 0.63 molar or 1.23 molar at 450. So then we were, we could we didn't find uh, a lot of, we didn't find antimony elsewhere apart from mainly in the solid phase. And so we, because we couldn't find antimony in the oil, we still wanted to check that, um, you know, what was the profile of the uh, bromine, for example? Uh, sorry, I meant bromine in that sense. What was the profile of bromine in the oil phase? We we had to use the uh, gas chromatograph with electron capture de detector, which is sensitive to bromine. And you can see here uh, that there were quite a, a, a lot of peaks, you know, though not not very uh, large amount in terms of the concentration, but the number was quite high uh, with reasonable sizes. In the oil, we obtained at 380 at at the lower temperature, and of course, as the temperature increased, we we saw uh, less uh, number of bruminated organics in in this uh, in in the oil and. When we increased the uh, temperature and the concentration, again, you can see here, uh, it still shows it's quite a sensitive detector. So even though we couldn't measure it uh, through wet chemical means, it could still pick up a little. But, but what we're showing here is that there's a, a much reduced and even uh, almost completely removed bromine in the organic phase at higher temperature, which is what we wanted to achieve uh, to produce uh, uh, almost a bromine free oil that can be used for uh, other things. And so when we looked at the oil uh, by analyzing it on a GCMS, we, we found that it contained mostly um, Aromatic compounds, as you can see here, uh, and, uh, and there were more than 62 different compounds identified uh, by GCMS, uh, but we didn't actually see, no matter how we tried to check, we didn't actually see any bruminated organic compound in the oil. And so these are the yields of the oil, ethyl benzene and uh, uh, and styrene and cumin, you know, dominated, and you also have diphenylpropane as one of the major uh, products. Of course, it was interesting that without um, the sodium hydroxide, we got much higher yield of ethyl benzene. Uh, of course, uh, that, that's because sodium hydroxide tends to, you know, react with these uh, compounds you know, either solubilize them to make the reaction, <coughs> to make the reactions even more, more uh, effective, uh, they, therefore producing more gases. So for, for the times or the experiments where we had used sodium hydroxide, we actually got higher gas yields, especially hydrogen, uh, due to the uh, reforming of some of these uh, compounds. And then we also tried the other uh, bruminated plastics, the ABS, uh, similar types of experiments. And um, uh, so I'll just go past that. The only thing to mention here is that uh, we actually looked into more detail into, uh, into the uh, uh, solid phase uh, using S3 uh, diffraction uh, spectroscopy to see what's going on in there. Uh, so again, you can see that almost the antimony was in the char. This is in percentage, uh, weight percentages. Uh, the bromine, nearly all of it was in the uh, water. And uh, the, the, the ABS itself ha had about 11 
uh, percent bromine and so almost all the bromine uh, was recovered in the aqueous phase um, and, and you can see the characterization of the solid residues showed the contents so there are plenty of bromine here uh, sorry antimony here um, and uh, when when one of the interesting things we saw was when we used the calcium hydroxide the antimony you know went more into uh, a, a kind of solid that could not be uh, digested by the uh, acid reagent so we couldn't get it out of uh, the product it formed with with uh, calcium Uh, and so the, these are the uh, different uh, yields we got in terms of the oils. You can see oil dominated the, the products uh, uh, and the, the, in terms of how, how much bromine is contained in there. In terms of gas products, again, we, we see that the gases uh, contain a lot of CO2 and and uh, as the sodium hydroxide concentration uh, increased, the CO2 or the alkali concentration, the CO2 uh, obviously decreased because uh, the sodium hydroxide helped in, in capturing the CO2 to form sodium carbonate or sodium hydrogen carbonate. And this is just the proof, uh, the uh, GCMS um, uh, chromatogram and the different components that were found in them. As you can see, they are all mostly uh, aromatic compounds. Uh, and here, this is the, uh, again, the oil products, the main uh, compounds found in the oil products, they're all aromatic. Uh, ethyl benzene and cumin being the dominant ones, uh, as well as toluene, toluene mostly from, from ABS. And as you can see, there are uh, there are signs to show that when we had we had a mixture of ABS and heaps, some of these compounds actually originated from ABS rather than uh, heaps. Okay, so now we're just going to go straight into the uh, the uh, printer circuit boards again the similar kind of uh, arrangement where we did the characterization we knew it contained 62 weight percent of volatiles and 38 percent of uh, uh, metals and we also carry out carried out uh, the experiments using the same batch uh, reactor and again you see the product distribution um, and here we are looking at the degree of depolymerization of the resin uh, based on the percentage of the, of the resin that we found initially. You can see that as the temperature increased, we were able to remove uh, more of the resin uh, in order to get back the, uh, the solid or the metals as the case uh, may be. Um, so here, sorry. So here we just showed the oil product from this uh, contained mostly phenolics because the, uh, the, the PCB, the resin is phenol based and you can see a lot of phenol being recovered from the liquid phase uh, because we haven't carried this, uh, this out under severe conditions. And the solids uh, again contained uh, majority of the uh, well, almost all the metals were found in the in the uh, solid phase. So just to go into the other chemistry, which is the supercritical water gasification of uh, plastics. Now this uh, has come up because of uh, the, what we hear in the news in terms of the different plastic uh, waste or waste plastic getting into the ocean uh, and creating a lot of uh, pollution. So we've just looked at the most common plastics, you know, the ones that they make up about 80% of plastic waste. So we've re reacted them in the presence of um, ruthenium oxide supported on gamma alumina, uh, different weight percentages. And yeah, these are, we just reacted it at 450 because we've had experience uh, into the uh, 
temperatures required for this kind of system. And again, we were looking at the carbon gasification efficiency and the hydrogen gasification efficiencies using this formula after the analysis of the products. Um, so you can see here the influence of loading ruthenium uh, from zero to 28 percent and how it has influenced the gas products. So you can see that as the uh, ruthenium weight percentage increase, you know, uh, more methane is produced. So, and of course more CO2 because of the kind of uh, catalytic mechanism involved. And the carbon gasification efficiencies, as you can see, uh, uh, increase as well as the percentage of uh, ruthenium increased. Uh, hydrogen gasification for this kind of system is always going to be higher than 100 because there's a lot of hydrogen contributed by the water medium itself in the final products. Now, what I wanted to show here is that by using ruthenium, we can actually get a gas composition that is very, very similar to what you see from AD after so many days or weeks. So, and this can happen in, in, in an hour. So where you get loads of methane and CO2 as the final products from plastics. And again, using the different plastics uh, that we use, there were not much differences apart from polystyrene, which surprisingly, you know, produced more, uh, produced very high yields of methane and CO2 uh, because of its rigid nature. So it needed to, uh, the aromatic ring needed to be decomposed in order for that reaction to occur. Where, while these are quite volatile, it wasn't as going to be as volatile as them. So the kind of reactions occurring in terms of the gasification were slightly different from the other polyolefins, as you can see. Uh, and so it gave us one of the highest uh, hydrogen gasification, nearly 200 twice, you know, the amount of hydrogen in the feedstock because of its reactivity with water under the conditions that we studied. Okay, and then we also looked at the influence of water to feed ratio. Uh, what happened if we change the amount of water uh, in the process, uh, just to check the, what, what the presence of water was doing. So as you can see, as we increase the, the, uh, the ratio, uh, sorry, this is the um, water to carbon ratio in LDPE. So as the water increased, the, the actual yield of methane increased, just giving us some, some insight into the role of water in this kind of system. And of course, it also increased the uh, gasification efficiencies. Okay, and we tried other catalysts uh, like uh, nickel oxide on alumina, on the same alumina we prepared by uh, wet impregnation or 15% uh, and 15% uh, uh, nickel oxide and 5% ruthenium on gamma alumina. And we couldn't get uh, the same kind of uh, uh, products in terms of the yield of uh, methane uh, as we got from the others, apart from in PP, which gave high, but just about half of what we would normally get with ruthenium uh, alone. Uh, but the, as we increase the concentration, sorry, the loading of uh, the nickel oxide, we got more um, C2 to C4 gases, mainly uh, we got a lot of propane formed in this uh, process. Of course, this wasn't what we were expecting we thought because ruthenium is an expensive catalyst. We could, you know, get um, a cheaper catalyst, but it didn't quite work as well as we thought. Um, one of the things we wanted to know was to understand the mechanism of the ruthenium uh, catalysis. And uh, the, this uh, is just uh, SEM images of the catalyst. This is the uh, fresh one, the used one. We, we won't be able to see much, but it is the SRD that's really interesting because you can see here that um, this is 
the fresh cash list and this is the cash list used and then call signed. So we can see that they're almost you know, identical. Uh, so it, it showed us that we could get back the, um, the ruthenium oxide by calcination. But again, one of the things we, we saw was that in the used catalyst that we didn't call sign, we had metallic ruthenium present. Uh, so there must be some redox uh, catalysis, you know, occurring here. And that was one of the insights we got from this study. Um, so we looked at um, real waste plastic that we got from MSW. Uh, we separated from a sample of MSW and it contained 21 different pieces of plastics. And again, which we call uh, MWP, again, with the same ruthenium, uh, we carried out the reactions. These are the uh, characteristics of the plastics after we pulverize them and analyze them. And the first uh, set of results here is just showing the products we obtained with our catalyst and with catalyst, you can see again with the ruthenium, over 93% of the plastic uh, became gas. And um, the, we didn't get any, any, any char uh, apart from ash. Uh, the ash uh, obviously came from the, the plastic uh, here being dirty. Um, we looked at the gas composition without and with catalyst. Again, you can see here uh, uh, methane and carbon dioxide being the products, the main products. And we looked at the uh, higher heating value. Again, oh, oh, that's obvious. Uh, when you have methane, it will be much higher. And we looked at hydro, uh, hydrocarbon selectivity uh, and uh, the carbon gasification, again, because you have more methane, you have higher hydrocarbon selectivity, hydrogen, the same way. Uh, and then we carried out the test using the same catalyst a number of times. So again, giving us more insight into the redox uh, catalysis. Uh, this is the initial use. And then we used it with our car signing and it dropped, the, the yields actually dropped, it became similar to what we would get with our catalyst. And then we, uh, apart from producing uh, a lot of CO2. And then we car signed it and the activity returned, as you can see here, we used it a number of times. There is some change in the, uh, in, in the, um, in the yields of products, but that change was simply because of the ash that is present in, in the catalyst, which was actually diluting the catalyst. Uh, uh, so the ash present in the feedstock, and you can see the different SEM images. And when we carry out EDS semi quantitative analysis of the fresh, sorry, that should be and used catalyst, you can see we began to see other types of elements present. These, these elements obviously came uh, from the feedstock itself because of its ash content. And that was what we thought, you know, affected the activity of the catalyst. Uh, again, you can see here uh, that without the calcine catalyst, uh, without calcining the used catalyst, you got a lot more peaks of different things uh, from calcium ruthenium oxide to calcium silicate to even iron oxide, calcium carbonate, calcium titan uh, titanium oxide. So different compounds, uh, of course, uh, ash compounds uh, were found when we did not, uh, when we um, used it in the presence uh, of the ash in the feedstock. And then after we calcined it, of course, the ruthenium peaks became a bit sharper, but we still had all of those uh, ash residues present in the catalyst, which is, uh, of course, not, not good for, for this kind of process. Uh, so using the, uh, the, the, uh, the data and the information we gathered from these different studies, we were able to establish that the catalysis uh, was based on a, a kind of redox cycle 
uh, basically you can regenerate the uh, the ruthenium by calcining it and we we came up with this scheme uh, this reaction scheme to show what's happening we we believe there's a lot of reforming at the initial stage which was actually with the ruthenium behaving like a, a, a reactant and therefore being uh, reduced in a redox way to ruthenium oxide and we were able to see uh, ruthenium sorry ruthenium um, zero basically ruthenium metal, metal was formed in the first stage and when we looked at the um, SRD we actually found a lot of metallic ruthenium uh, 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 at the very first stage and then there will be the water gas shift reaction because we didn't get carbon monoxide, uh, not a lot. Of course, we get carbon monoxide without uh, uh, the ruthenium. Uh, so it must be playing a kind of role, uh, but there's plenty of water in the system to drive the uh, water gas shift reaction. And then we, we, we think there's also some hydrogenolysis being, being um, uh, not just hydrogenolysis, sorry, we have some uh, methanation reaction being promoted by the ruthenium uh, metal uh, in order to give us that high yield of methane. So we're able to, you know, try to use the uh, products to mirror what was happening in order to get very, fairly similar to the use of products we, we get from the uh, actual reaction. So modeling the reaction in this way. Um, and then when we look at um, the different types of uh, plastic like LDP, they give us something slightly different, which of course, because uh, of the re different products we got, we, we thought that there is in addition to the, um, to the methanation reaction to produce methane, there must be some direct hydrogenolysis, you know, occurring, you know, uh, on the very volatile uh, initial products you get from the thermal decomposition of this kind of plastics, uh, because we ended up with a lot more methane, you know, uh, than CO2. Whereas for polystyrene, it was uh, almost uh, the same yields of methane and and CO2. So getting much, much more methane than CO2 will mean that there is another reaction occurring that you know, we, we think that must be producing uh, methane. Okay, so nearly coming to the end now, thank you. Uh, and so we thought we should just uh, you know, mention some of the uh, exciting news we, we've seen recently about people looking to use hydrothermal processing as a way of dealing with uh, marine debris as well as uh, you know plastics, all sorts of plastics. So these were just picked up from the internet about some exciting news from uh, you know, 2019 uh, about this type of plastics uh, to fuel powered ship, ships that will be collecting the debris and using hydrothermal processing to convert them to uh, fuel. And of course, here in the UK, there's the big news of uh, something that be going on on tin side. So, uh, so this technology appears to be going somewhere and uh, we being haven't been involved in the last 10 to 15 years. It's uh, really exciting, you know, to hear about uh, this. So um, in conclusion, we, we believe that hydrothermal processing can be applied to all types of plastics. Uh, it depends on the chemistry you want to exploit. And of course, we showed that for brominated plastics, we need to de-brominate uh, and then solubilize the, uh, bro uh, the bromine or halogen or halides. And then you can go on to secondary reactions that will produce the hydrocarbon liquids that will be of interest. Uh, but uh, uh, one of the uh, good things about the process, uh, whether it is thermal degradation or supercritical water gasification, is that there is easy separation and recovery of reaction products, uh, especially for gasification. 
where it occurs uh, at high pressure and you get the products at high pressure. That means uh, storage of uh, products like methane or CO2 uh, will not be uh, very difficult. So we can achieve complete gasification in an hour, uh, very high use of methane due to uh, methanation, and in some cases, uh, CC hydrogenolysis. Uh, we use the data we obtain from this reaction to confirm some redox catalytic mechanism for using ruthenium. Um, but of course, the presence of ash is a problem uh, because it would dilute the uh, heterogeneous catalyst. So we can apply this process for both dry and wet plastics. Um, water is essential for the reaction. So it, it's not uh, a, a case of, um, well, plastics is dry. Why do you need the water? It's part of the reaction. So it's not just a medium, it's a reactant and it can also uh, you know, be a catalyst when you have things like hydrolysis occurring. They offer the potential to recycle very difficult uh, plastic wastes like the thermosets. Uh, and of course, uh, we saw from the news articles that there's a potential for on-site recycling of plastics in the oceans. So I just want to thank uh, the people who've been providing funding for this uh, research and my current research, um, uh, which is not, of course, what we're talking about today, but just to say thank you to all, for all, to all the funders and to my previous uh, line manager who, who brought me to the UK in the first instance and uh, helped me through uh, my years here to uh, establish myself in UK academia and my former PhD student. And also thank you for uh, to my current research team. Uh, people say it's not very gender balanced, but I'm happy the way it is. So uh, thank you all for listening and um, uh, if you have any questions. Thank you. Oh, well, we've got quite a few questions coming in the chat already. Oh, trouble. Um, so, uh, Mariea would like to know um, if you have any corrosion issues with halogen containing plastics like PVC and does the reactor material need to be altered as even nickel alloys can be corroded at more extreme conditions? Yes. Uh, so like um, I said in one of the slides, we, uh, showed when we didn't add sodium hydroxide or alkali, we ended up with a pH of uh, one, which is highly acidic, which would, and the liquid came out very green, which we suspect will be iron two in the first instance. So there's no question about it. The, the halogens, they will corrode without the addition of alkali. Uh, what we also tried to do was to use glass liners, so quartz liners, which helped to uh, you know, protect the, um, the walls of the reactor. Um, so Michael has asked, have you ever thought about using high throughput methods to speed up the testing? Um, it, it, you, that would mean a continuous, a continuous rig. Um, yes, I am not tired of thinking. It's just that I need the money to be able to build one. That's that's the only reason. So yes, uh, I think that is perfectly possible. Uh, but we just need to get the funding to do that. Okay. So Keith also asked about continuous processes, and I I was going to ask that question as well because I did yeah. continuous hydrothermal in my PhD. Yeah. So, um, Adrian had a question. I'm going to allow him to ask it. So, um, Adrian, if you want to unmute yourself and ask. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. And uh, Jude, a, a fascinating presentation. And I was pleased to see that in your plastics bin, most of that material could be recycled. Um, this topic is very much out of the moment. Are you, I mean, the plastics industry has just announced that it's already committed to invest in 7 billion euros by 2030 in these kinds of uh, in chemical recycling. Right. A couple of observations. Um, I heard you say that about depolymerizing uh, polymers and then taking and breaking down the monomer. For the plastics industry, those monomers are what they want. There's greater value in that than I mean, broken down further. There's already work going on with polystyrene to depolymerize that. 
yes. uh, and investments going in in, uh, in that scale. Um, for the um, HBCD, uh, uh, the the bromelated flame retardants, you know, it does present a, a challenge, and uh, there have been some dissolution methods looking at uh, getting rid of that. Uh, but it's not true chemical recycling because you can obviously solubilize other materials. I'm coming at it from more of an end user perspective, and I'm quite interested in what the concentration of bromine would be in your aqueous phase. Um, the fillers will potentially react with the uh, with the bromine uh, if they're, for instance, calcium uh, uh, carbonate. Um, a couple of small points. I'm really interested in the amount of plastics uh, that can be processed per gram of uh, your catalyst and support media before you have to regenerate. And going to clean up of the oceans, I mean, the fishy fact about more plastics than ocean, than, uh, than fish in the ocean by 2050 is a myth. Nobody knows the weight of fish in the ocean, yeah. whether it's 1%, 0.05% or even less than that. It's still too much. And I really question this whole concept of, you know, um, powering vessels from collected plastics in the ocean, whether it will be so highly dispersed as to whether that, that's going to be feasible or not. There's a lot of um, noise in the media about it, uh, but I suspect, you know, to be honest, it's, it's a myth when it comes down to the practicalities of that. So a couple of questions really is, why go beyond depolymerization? Can you keep the your outputs, you know, with longer carbon chains because those are what the plastics industry really want. It doesn't want it taken back to hydrogen and methane. Yes. Uh, what's the concentration of bromine in the aqueous phase? Um, because that would then give you an indication of how recover recoverable that is. Okay, so um, thank you, thank you, Adrian, for 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 the questions. In terms of um, why, why go beyond depolymerization? Um, sometimes um, in academia, we just feel, you know, why not go higher? You know, you just go higher. High temperature means uh, cleaner products. But to be fair, we, we do know that if you use uh, more um, gentle, gentler, uh, well, you use a gentler uh, uh, condition, then you will end up with more of the monomers. So we, we showed that when we looked at the um, uh, PCB that by using much lower temperature, one of the things I haven't shown here is where we have used the uh, ethylene glycol for PCB. Um, we actually use much lower temperatures and therefore the yield of uh, phenol, uh, phenol and aniline were quite, quite high. So we didn't quite produce a lot of the degradation products. Uh, so it depends on the process conditions in order to, to uh, minimize uh, further degradation of the uh, depolymerize, uh, depolymerization products. Now, in terms of the bromine, um, we were quite careful not to use too much water. So you saw there that we had uh, about 10 grams of this and 10 grams of that, uh, uh, of the plastic containing 11% um, uh, bromine is obviously 1.1 1, 1 1 gram of bromine in 15 mil of water. So that was, that would be about the type of concentration we dealt with. Uh, but again, we were trying, you know, the hydrothermal reactors we used, they were quite expensive. We didn't want to go any higher because we didn't want to damage the reactor and then we don't have money to continue the research. So it was just being cautious. Uh, we didn't think that would be the limit, but we, we had tried, uh, you know, that sort of concentration, uh, you know, with caution. Uh, for the ocean cleanup, uh, I quite agree with you uh, that it, it's, it can be difficult, but I think that if they concentrate in those areas, the like the uh, the Great uh, Pacific Garbage Patch, where you actually have high concentration uh, of plastics, then that might be uh, uh, be the the a, a kind of uh, way to look at it. But if they are going to go, you know, 
burning fuel, going around the oceans, then they might actually be making, uh, creating worse pollution than, than the plastics uh, are already doing. So I think it's just about looking at those areas where you have uh, large proportions of plastics collected in an area. And that may be a solution because you can spend days or weeks or months, you know, uh, converting the plastics and storing them and then bringing uh, the products uh, on shore um, rather than just going around and scavenging for plastics all over the ocean. I don't think I, I, I'm, did I answer all the questions? I'm yeah, not sure. That, that's great. I'm hoping to visit every in the near future. So no doubt okay. we will meet. Okay. Um, and of course in the Gaias, um, yes. they are, the plastics are still highly dispersed that through the water column. Um, but um, you know, time will tell it's the greatest innovator. So yes. I, I'd love to be proved wrong. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you, you answered my questions really well. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, so we are a little over time. Are you happy to con continue answering questions? Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Thank you. Um, so Devaduta asks, is re in the redox steam reforming, did you see uh, ruthenium leaching? Um, in the water, into the water. Um, uh, I'm not sure we, we actually tested the water for, for ruthenium. Um, no, I'm not. I'm not sure we we tested the water for ruthenium. I I, I can't just tell you that, that we tested the water for ruthenium, uh, but we were we we're just looking at the solid products and trying to recover ruthenium from from there. So it is possible. It is something to take note of to see if um, there were any ruthenium in in the water. Uh, the analysis of the water phase we did was just to check for any dissolved carbon uh, rather than uh, ruthenium. But thank you. That's uh, a good question and uh, it will be something to look at. So in the interest of time, I'll just ask some questions from new people. And if we have time, yeah. I'll go back to the second questions. Um, sure. so Ian's asking um, which other catalysts might be used to array, obtain aromatics from the poly polyolefins rather um, by the hydrothermal liquefaction? Yes, we, uh, what, uh, in one of the slides, I can actually uh, share that slide here, uh, where I haven't shown uh, here, where we have used nickel, nickel oxide uh, instead. We didn't think, you know, using reduced nickel was going to be effective because we had tried things like that in the past where we spent hydrogen, you know, reducing the metal and then we put it into water, it gets oxidized back to, to, to the oxide. So it wasn't something we wanted to, 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 to check. So we looked at nickel oxide. So this is just the gas products well, we, we also analyzed the liquid uh, products from this uh, because the majority of the product uh, we got was oil from, from here. And the oil products we got were, were all hydrocarbons. Okay, so it's not shown here in this in this slide, and because our focus here was on gasification, so the the oil has not been emphasized here. But the oil product uh, was mainly hydrogen. So nickel is is a, a good candidate uh, for uh, liquefaction. Okay. So um, Jonathan Wagner asks. Um, uh, could you comment a bit on the scale up and energy efficiency of these conditions, um, i.e. if you've done any process modelling on the reactions and separation of your products? Um, no, we, we haven't done any modelling. In fact, this is something um, since, since moving to uh, Aston from Leeds, um, I, I have uh, developed a collaboration with uh, internally with some of my colleagues who are in, in the modeling business and we're actually looking at at um, you know looking at this process and modeling it um, in terms of energy um, what we've seen so far in the literature and from our experience is is the fact that uh, of course is energy intensive um, but uh, because you can also recover the energy uh, from the hot water during the cooling stage uh, in a continuous process that we've, we've heard about. Uh, it means that you can 
recover a lot of the uh, of the heat and use it for preheating. And studies done in the U.S. Uh, has shown uh, have shown that that makes the energy uh, efficiency that improved the energy efficiency considerably. Um, thank you. Um, by the way, there's lo lots of thanks for a great presentation. I'm just not reading them out in the end. All right. Okay. Thank I you. I just wanted to pass that on as well. Thank um, you. So, Ea, or Ea, um, apologies if I'm mispronouncing it, um, asks for the ruthenium oxide catalyst, which seems to be very efficient, that um, due to the ash accumulation, it would not be possible to use it by regenerating. How could you prevent accumulation? And is there a cheaper option to the ruthenium? Um, again, we, we've tried different types of uh, catalysts. Um, uh, well, the, the issue of ash accumulation is, is, a, is a real one, is a serious one. Um, it, it can't, because of the products that you form, when you have this, you can see the ruthenium did not just come out of ruthenium oxide on its own. It's actually you know, formed uh, compounds with calcium. Uh, so that will be a kind of chemical um, processing in order to get uh, ruthenium back, which will be expensive. I, I do uh, honestly think that it's a problem you can solve even before the processing. So by, you know, trying to, you know, remove the ash, you know, either by washing, uh, uh, you know, Again, some people will argue that if you wash, then you generate wastewater. But but you know, there's always you you solve one problem and you create one, and it depends on which one you feel is more serious. But I think re trying to remove more of the ash before processing will be a better option than trying you know to regenerate the ruthenium when it's already reacted with the ash. Okay. Thank you. Um, Noel asks, um, have you used multi-layered plastics or MLPs in your reactor? Um, uh, we will want to believe that um, the uh, we have used them, um, what, what do you call it? Carbon fiber reinforced plastics. So we've reacted those as well. Uh, which obviously contain different plastics and there are different layers uh, there, if that sort of thing you are talking about. But the objective of that was to recover the carbon fiber by depolymerizing the plastics. So we've done that um, and we've done that in the presence of um, homogeneous catalysts like um, sodium hydroxide, which, which helped you know, to uh, improve the rate of uh, resin removal in order to recover the, um, the carbon fiber. Uh, uh, I mentioned before, we've also tried other organic uh, solvents, so co-solvents co like ethylene glycol. Uh, and, and in that particular instance, using ethylene glycol, it gave us a, a better carbon fiber in terms of the mechanical properties of the carbon fiber. However, the ethylene glycol itself degraded to compounds and so we couldn't recover it. So again, these are uh, issues. Uh, and we read that somebody said, oh, ethylene glycol is good for making hydrogen. So we just gasified the, the liquid product and converted it to hydrogen. Okay. So I think he was asking about sort of, um, uh, uh, Adrian suggested he was using multi-laminated plastics. Using oh, okay, no, stuff. we, we uh, haven't tried those ones. I assume the answer was no. Yeah, no. So James McGregor asks, if for the metal containing plastic waste, such as PCBs, um, can the metals present in the waste play, are they playing a catalytic role? It, it, yes, it, it depends on the type of metals. Um, uh, of course, PCBs contain things like copper, and we know copper can play a catalytic role in, in gasification, for example. Uh, so again, it depends on the reaction conditions. If we are sticking with, you know, just low, low temperature processing, so these metals may, you know, not get to the stage of becoming catalyst, but at high temperatures, yes, they will participate as a catalyst. Okay. Um, 
And um, the last new person question is Arthur Garfeth, who asks, have you considered using supercritical water to remove colours and additives other than the fire retardants? Uh, nope, we haven't tried okay. other, other the ones, no. That's simple. <laughs> <laughs> interesting idea for the future, maybe. Yeah, 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 that's interesting, yeah. Okay, I think we'll wrap the questions up there. So I hope yeah. um, that's okay with everybody. I yep. put the link to our YouTube channel in the chat. The talk will go up there. Just give us a few days for processing. Um, okay. Get it up. Um, thank you very much, Jude, for a really excellent talk. I think that's the most questions we've ever had. So obviously, really wow, okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I'll just draw your attention if you at our webinars page we have a couple of upcoming webinars um, we have a patents for chemists protecting your invention that's um, targeted at ecrs but um anyone can join so i hope that's of interest and then next month we have computational predictions in organ or uh, i can't read today i'm very sorry organometallic catalysts are we nearly there yet um by natalie fay which should be an excellent talk um, and as I said, all our past webinars are up on our YouTube channel where the um, speaker has been happy to share. Um, we have our data management workshop tomorrow, um, which is all about data management of catalysis data and where the field is now. So um, if that's of interest to you, please do join us um, and have a very lovely month and hope to see you next month. Thanks again, June. Um, I will end the webinar and um, I hope to see you all in person at some point soon. Thank you.